everyone, it's Sean from HFR and welcome back to our channel. Uh, I'll start out this video uh, giving a quick plug and just say if you're new to this channel, please consider subscribing for repair videos like the one you're about to watch today. Uh, and if you enjoyed this video, uh, please give it a thumbs up and if you want to discuss it, leave some comments in the uh, comment section and I'd be happy to answer questions or, or communicate with you all through there. Uh, if you're interested in HFR business side of things, uh, i.e. send me something to repair for the business side, you can find that my business website. It's a Google site. Uh, link is in the description. Also, if you're just a general supporter of the channel, uh, I have enabled super supers or whatever it's called. Uh, so if you want to make a donation, obviously YouTube is going to take a cut. Uh, you know, you can use that supers function uh, within the description here on YouTube to donate to the channel. All those things go into, I don't use those things for repairing people's products, any donations. I use that for things that I uh, procure in order to repair just for making general videos, not necessarily, not for customer related uh, content. But anyways, uh, we're going to take a look at a Nakamichi uh, AM FM radio. I believe this is a TM-1, as seen here on the back. Now, this radio came by way of a uh, gene, uh, much like the Zoom H4N, I think it was, and the uh, Sony um, <clears throat> receiver system that both got repaired here on the channel. And this one, he said, was a uh, was is owned by a friend and had ra rather sentimental value uh, to his friend. So... Gene, I appreciate you sending it in, and yes, I'd love to get this working for your friend. Now, the description you gave is it doesn't power on, and hopefully we can rectify that, and hopefully there's there are no alignments that are needed or anything else, uh, which we'll cover as necessary if the work dictates that we need to cover those things. Now, this um, Nakamichi uh, AM FM radio is actually a rather unique device. This was made around mid 1985, uh, 1980s ish, you know, during a time frame when, uh, when many uh, consumer products, uh, especially coming from overseas, were trying to make things very convenient in order to get sales. I mean, uh, you know, putting something out there that, that did something that the competitors didn't do in order to entice a buyer to procure their product. Uh, no different than what Nakamichi did with this specific radio. Now, uh, some of the cool features, well, obviously, you know, as typical with these transistor-based radios from the 80s, this is a super heterodyne, uh, common AM and FM receiver operating in the broadcast range off of 120 volts AC, making use of a permanent magnet, a permanent magnet dynamic loudspeaker, as opposed to more vintage radios that used a voice cool and a uh, non-permanent magnet, an electromagnetic magnet per se. Now this radio is made out of plastic. There are no Bakelite. There's no Catalan whatsoever. Okay. It's also a clock radio. And that's one of those things that actually is uh, pretty unique about this because it's not just a clock radio for the individual has this on so their side of the bed to set a time for an alarm. But on the back as well, if you were to you had a satellite uh, module, per se, about the, roughly the same size as this with its own speaker and everything that allowed for a secondary uh, clock and secondary alarm to be set. Uh, so that way, the other individual who, who uh, was on the other side of the bed, so husbands and wives, right, they each had their own little module that they could interact with for setting their alarms all tied to the same stereo system. However, the, this one sent in, uh, the TM2 module uh, wasn't sent in with it, and there was no need per se, I guess, because quite honestly, the uh, uh, either the individual didn't have one or it just didn't need repair. We can see our antenna hookups here. We can see our mode select from mono to stereo, and then our alarm, alarm volume, uh, volume control there, as well as a 9-volt battery uh, to allow us to uh, save our, our clock in case... Uh, our time in case we you were to lose power. Okay, looks like we have one missing screw up here on the left, one on the right, but we do have one right there, so it shouldn't be too hard to get into. 
uh, typical uh, complements of buttons and things to push here on the top. Uh, on off, reset, time set, alarm one and two, alarm mode and sleep, and then of course your snooze button. Which kind of where's our tuning at? Yes, up here on the front. AM, FM, so we can change between our, an amplitude or frequency modulated uh, signal. Tuning up and down, seeking up and down. And then memory most likely to store in your favorite radio stations. But uh, we can go ahead and at least take a, a voltmeter to our port here and make sure that there's no issues with that. And then afterwards we can plug it in and see and can just confirm. Ah, I got 51 ohms. So it's a little bit lower than what I would suspect. I was suspected to be a little bit higher than that, but who knows? Maybe it's hitting a transformer in there, and that's a low impedance transformer. Um, at least it's not directly shorted, so I'm not overly concerned. But uh, I guess we'll find out about some things as we move along. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and plug it in. And yes, I do have this connected up through my dim bulb tester in case there is a short, so I'm not ruining anything in the radio. Okay, it is plugged in. And uh, my Variac is set to roughly 120 volts AC, and we'll press the on-off button. And as the customer mentioned, it does not power on. So no need to uh, leave that in there. I'll set that to the side. And I, I guess from this point is determining why is it not turning on, which means we need to start taking it apart. So let's do that. This half containing the basically our uh, I/O input output button control module. Okay, all of our buttons right here, and uh, there we go. <clears throat> all of our buttons right here on this uh, PCB. Uh, what's going to drive the the display on front and this PCB and our speaker, and then the bulk of our radio and power and amplification all happening over here. I suppose we can at minimum check the speaker out on this thing. So let me try to get a tone through our speaker. And let's see. All right. So I've got my transmitter on and or my transmission test set, I will see if we can get a tone across our speaker. It's two wires, really. And yeah, I might need to turn off the, the filters for my uh, microphone pickup. Let me do that real quick. and. Let's see. Okay. Sorry if this gets a little loud. But there you go. Speaker is working just fine. Well, oddly enough, I, I did find one screw inside of here. And uh, I think it stuck to our, our magnet over here. And I think... I've discovered where it came from over here on this part of the display. It looks like that's 
stripped out. So no wonder it uh, got loose. That, uh, either way, we can we can do something with that a bit later. Now, I don't think anything's going to be on this side, side of the issue because obviously when we press a button, it doesn't turn on. I don't even get any static out. I get nothing. No display indication, no speaker indication. So I believe our issue is going to primarily be on this side of, of the uh, radio. So I'm going to move this out of the way. And as suspected, we do have a transformer in there. And that's probably why I was getting at a uh, fairly low uh, impedance measurement, uh, or I should say DC resistance measurement across our primary on this uh, transformer, this power transformer. Uh, secondary looks like it's soldered through board. But uh, let's see, we got our antenna input here and another antenna here uh, to set up our, our um, you know, basically our incoming signal and establish sensitivity. Um, we have a daughter board here loosely attached. Uh, I don't see any bulging caps just right off the get go. Maybe there's a fuse or something on here. I'm not too sure. But I'll tell you what, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to I'm going to take this out and, and work on taking out this bottom board and it, it, enough for me to really get into this thing and and uh, really troubleshoot. I'm going to have to be very careful that I'm not breaking any of our um, wires coming off of this coil over this ferrite rod sitting in here. I don't want to break any of those because that's going to affect our antenna. But, uh, man, was there a cover at one point? I see outside shielding, but nothing over top. And we definitely have uh, some have uh, IF and adjustments for our AM and, and uh, FM. Uh, this might actually bring in our antenna. That might be an adjustment for, for the antenna. I don't know. Uh, I couldn't really find any service uh, manuals for this radio, so which is not a hundred percent needed, but would be I would be a little more grateful if there was one. But uh, yeah, let me get this further apart and I'll poke around. Maybe we can figure out first off uh, if our power is getting to somewhere and then where that's disappearing at. So I've gotten this guy well enough apart to take a good look around the board. And um, I haven't really made any measurements yet. But I did annotate a couple things. Let me get some of my tools out of the way here. Uh, I ended up putting this daughter board somewhat back on because it has this uh, backing on it. And that is to keep the, uh, the leads on the back end of these through hole components from shorting out to anything underneath it. And I just kind of wanted to get that cardboard spacer back in there. Now, typical uh, Japanese fashion, uh, Sony is Japanese product, right? But anyways, you find the typical things that kind of just irk me about uh, their manufacturing processes from the early 80s. You have a lot of long leads and stuff left on your PCB here. Actually, can I zoom in a bit? Okay, there we go. And again, might might be hard for you to see here, but uh, you you have incredibly long leads off a lot of your three hole components coming out of this board, pretty much everywhere. Especially concerning that, I think it's a rectifier or transistor sitting right here. Another incredibly long lead just sitting right here. I mean, if I do the camera this way, now you can tell. See how long that lead is? Uh, so not a whole lot of trimming was done after these components went in at the factory. So you can get the, these two to show up better. Yeah, somewhat, but you can probably tell those right there. Anyways, uh, it was doing a visual inspection, uh, just looking around because that's you know typically the first thing you do. 
And I did notice uh, down here by this, uh, what's the marking on this? 223 KCK. So, you know, this is a disk capacitor. 223 means that it is 0 0.022 microfarad. Okay. Um, but we have some discoloration down here on the board. Might be a bit hard for you to tell, but uh, you can kind of see it right in there. Discoloration around that cap, and then one of the legs off of that cap is also discolored. As a matter of fact, it's this leg right here. Okay. Thought I also saw one cap with a slight bulge on the top and I'd have to go back and find it again but it was one over here um here goes a B507 uh, I believe that is going to be a MPN or PMP excuse me transistor sitting right down in here See if I can get this without a shadow on it. Can I and get a light over this guy a little bit better? Maybe not. There we go. I'm angled right now. There goes that one transistor. So like I said, for the rectification, this entire IC sitting here is most likely handling our audio amplification. Looks like we have some form of rectifier here. Because I see AC written on both sides. I see a positive and a negative side. And it has D for diode above it. So I assume that that is a rectifier. But, uh, you know, what took this out? Well, I'm primarily focused on this cap right here because of this, this discoloration. Now, I know it's 0 0.022 microfarad but I don't know the voltage rating. When I flip the board over, one leg of that cap, as a matter of fact, the leg that's discolored goes through hole over onto this side. And if we follow this around, we can see that this is one of our leads coming out of our transformer. And of course that big cap's in right here. This goes from here to here or excuse me, here to here. Um, so I'm wondering if that has something to do with it. And there's no way around it. I'm going to have to plug this in while it's out to get a voltage reading. So I can determine what value, or what voltage rating potentially uh, was used for that capacitor. But while I'm doing that, I can also check our outputs here on our transformer just to see if they're all good. I'm oddly enough, I'm not finding any fuses in here whatsoever. Nothing marked with an F, F so far. Several ICs. I don't know if we'll be able to find replacements for them if they happen to be bad. Transistors and stuff, no big deal. Capacitors and stuff, no big deal. Um, diodes and resistors, no big deal. But, uh, you know, these ICs might be obsolete. They might not be easy to come by anymore. It's all things to consider. Uh, so I'm going to try to find a way to get this. Uh, I'm going to mark some, some of my concerns on this board with a red marker. Uh, Sharpie marker, i.e. like this right here. And then I'm going to go around to the back and then just mark where their pins come through the board. And uh, I'm going to either remove them and test them outside the board or at least check to see what voltage is getting to them. So let me mark some things around the board and I'll come back. Okay, again, don't do what I'm doing, all right? 
Um, we can make our AC measurement 120 volts and in honesty should be this way because <laughs> that's our return. But uh, I'm going to find a ground and seven, seven. So this is what? 14 volt rail. Okay. Nothing on here. That's probably going to be our ground. We got 20 on this. And then, of course, if we measure across, it's going to show 7 volts AC. But um, 10 volts AC. 11 volts AC. Measure across, we get four. Here goes the bridge rectifier. And there we go. See if I can get this out of the light here. All right, so that's going to be tied to that ground there. Let me check the DC value. Oh, I got to be careful of that. We got six coming out, 12 going in. All right. Here's one of our caps, one I suspected was bad. And, um, uh, Hmm. Showing a DC measurement. 27. However, And go to AC. All right, so the 27 volts AC sitting on this side or well, my DC component is there. All right. What about this guy? 4 volts AC. 20 volts AC. That's the other 322. But uh this comes off of that leg and this one that leg, so basically a filter cap across the line essentially. So yeah, four volt difference. No DC component across it. I'm gonna work off the assumption that we're probably about uh, 50 BDC 25. VAC concerning those uh, disc capacitors. Um, here goes the bulging cap where it was at. Let me check it. Hmm. Rather interesting. Now it might just be a DC measurement. Go over here. I've only seen 2.4 volts DC. To be honest, I'm a tad bit stumped on this one without a schematic. Uh, it's going to be a lot of prodding around, making measurements. I might just need to pull the components out and test them out of circuit. Here goes that rectifier. 12 volts or NP and transistor, excuse me. 12 volts.
All right. I think that's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to pull these, uh, a few of these capacitors out, measure them out of circuit. Uh, I'm going to pull the rectifier out, measure it out of circuit. I'm going to pull the, that transistor out and measure it out of circuit and then just start to go from there. But this is kind of looking like it's primarily going to be an issue of, uh, of bad capacitors on our uh, rectified DC side of the board. Let me unplug this. And uh, just for the sake of well, did you check the on off switch and if I go across two of these leads are connected but if I go across them this way I shouldn't have any uh, I should have discontinuity there shouldn't be any continuity um, let me put it up on the table like this and we will balance that right there and let's see if I can get my leads on it and press the button at the same time there we go yeah I would say the on off button is working just fine with the uh, caps here removed, put this up here, make some measurements, and I should begin 0 0.022 microfarad or 22 nanofarad. Now I've given these sufficient time to cool down because that will affect their voltage rating. And we're getting 33 on it, uh, which I think is outside of 20% tolerant. Not that these caps have a 20% tolerance. They might have 5 or 10. But I'm um, pretty sure that is outside of 20. 35, I went ahead and mo removed this one right here, and I'm in basically the same thing. All right, and then the bulging cap, 4.7 microfarad, 50 volt. And we're getting 5.3. So is that within 10? Uh, let me take a look at something. Okay, yeah, so 5.3 is going to be outside of 10. Won't be outside of 20%, but uh, let's do a 22 nanofarad or whatever. Yeah, 10%, 24, so. What if we were at 20% and 26? Yeah, we're way outside on these caps. Both of those are definitely going to be replaced. This one might could stay in, but I'm going to replace it anyways because the top is a tad bit bulged. Um, something else. Let's uh, let's take a look at this transistor here. Now that B507 is actually a uh, PNP, okay. I said NPN earlier, I'm wrong. And when we look at it from the face and the first leg on the left, count over, we should be. Um, then one should be on the far left, and that should be our base, followed by our collector on pin two and emitter on pin three. So pin one, pin two, pin three, left to right on this guy right here. Which means that pin one, I marked it up here, is this lead right here. Okay, and with it out, we can now make our measurements. Without components in there, skewing what we're reading. And let's see, negative to base. Collector. Oh, I've got this on capacitor. I was checking some things a minute ago, but anyways. Uh, 3 meg base to collector. 
3 meg base to emitter. It's not looking too bad. I do not have a short collector to emitter. Let me swap my leads around. And we are open and not biased with the lead swapped around base to collector, base to emitter. Quick rectifier check before I uh, move on to the capacitors. You see how we have the positive indicator right here at the top? Put that into the camera. Over here, maybe that will come through. But uh, either way, positive is marked right up here. Okay. So I'm going to take the positive and flop it around this way and orient it to the right. Now, that doesn't mean that your positive probe goes there. That's just where your positive DC will be presented. And then, of course, opposite to that is going to be the negative. Now, as a picture, uh, here we go. You can see positive this way, negative this way, and our AC. And in between these dials, this is a full wave bridge rectifier, by the way. Uh, can I make this bigger? Or get a bigger picture. Yeah. There we go. Just so you have an orientation. So cathode is pointing where we'll have our positive voltage at. Okay. And the anode over here. Okay. Coming out the back end. So what this means is we actually orient our probes like this. Cathode to anode. So I should see read like a diode from here to here, and I do, and from here to here, and I do, and all those, it's a um, combined voltage drop when you go across two, so 0.5, I'm oh, sorry, shorten out the leads there, 0.5, so obviously here, you're going to have a one volt drop, okay? Same thing here, 0.5, one volt drop. And then again, if I move this over this way, one volt drop. It means when I turn this around, okay, I shouldn't get anything whatsoever. Not here, not here, not here, not here. There's no point in time am I biasing the diodes in here. Nor should I have any continuity or a voltage drop between my AC inputs either this way or this way. So the rectifier is working. All right. So I've tested the transformer. I've tested the rectifier. I've tested that uh, uh, PNP transistor right there. Um, and primarily, as I'm suspecting, since we have an on-off button, this appears to be on the low voltage side of things. I don't believe this to be at a higher, say, uh, higher voltage side. So I'm primarily concerned with capacitors at this point, as I previously mentioned. You know, anytime I'm looking at something and AC's coming in, there's there's a transformer, and I'm getting an output of my transformer. My rectifier is reading good. I know I've got regulated voltage, you know, at whatever that is, say it's 24 or 30 or 45 or 50, whatever it is, my regulated voltage is going to be there. But when you have, you know, on off buttons, usually, okay, uh, typically they don't go to that directly tied anywhere to that regulated DC you develop. They come they're typically tied to a lower DC line, okay? And so when there's an issue with power up and power cycling and, and a lot of electronics that have uh, similar to this, I'm primarily concerned with something that's being regulated further, so a, a lower DC voltage, if I can put it that way. So that's my assumptions at this point. Now, the majority of these caps are 25 volt cap, uh, capacitors. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm going to be checking those capacitors on that kind of rectified DC side to see if any of them are bad. And if 
and affecting my low, what I would think would be a lower voltage side because of our um, voltage regulation regulating that's occurring on here. And, uh, and just go through and just keep checking caps and, and, and maybe we find a few bad ones like uh, these two right here. And maybe that result resolves the issue, but if not, I'm obviously going to have to do a lot more troubleshooting, which means I'm going to have to start tracing things out to the different components to see if we uh, have a voltage at those components. And I think the best way to move forward after checking capacitors is to kind of look at these ICs and see if I can get a schematic for them and then make measurements at those ICs to see if, uh, to see if I'm getting voltages at the pins. But that's the game plan. And if I find anything out interesting, I'll come back and show you. Okay, and find some things we have accomplished. Now, before I show you these capacitors with my multimeter, uh, if you haven't kind of annotated by this portion of the video, there's a general outline I follow when I'm troubleshooting things like this. Uh, if I don't have schematics or can't find schematics for it, it's basically a general rule I have for all electronics. The, the first thing I accomplish is, is a visual inspection. You cannot uh, supplant a good visual inspection, okay? That is first and foremost. No matter what, you can solve not probably a good 90% of your problems just with a very thorough and good visual inspection. And usually that takes you to components that look, you know, burnt or cracked or something, in, in which case you can just go ahead and test those out and you know, ultimately you typically discover they are in fact bad. Now, beyond visual inspection, especially when you're dealing with something like a power issue, uh, I typically, the next thing I go to is voltage regulation. Okay. You see me test in, um, basically rectifiers and power transistors, uh, Darlington type transistors and stuff like that in my previous videos. You know, that's the second thing I did here, essentially, was our rectifier, this uh, power transistor sitting here. Now, I'm not talking about just little switching NPN and PNP transistors. I'm talking about something that's, you know, designed to dissipate a lot of power or provide rectification. So that's the second thing I tackle. And there are typically less of those components on the board, so it also makes it easier and can be a logical next step. And then from there... Then I start getting into really uh, capacitors because they are ultimately one of the biggest issues, especially electrolytics and a lot of electronics, especially as they age. It's also can be the most time consuming. However, there is a benefit for doing this for so long. Uh, there are several rules I follow. If I'm in the power supply section, uh, generally speaking, I'm looking at something probably around, you know, within 20% of its assigned value. If I'm dealing with something that's, you know, a very, uh, needs to be a highly accurate frequency, like uh, an intermediate frequency, so I'm in an IF section on a radio, you know, I'm looking for something closer to five or 10% is the general rule of thumb I follow. If I'm in like an audio section, 10%. There are some other things that you just develop over time. I know that um, a component that's only mi one microfarad I won't be able to test while it's in circuit because I'm just not going to get a reading with this multimeter. Okay. So if I need to test something that's one microfarad or less, I have to remove one leg of that component in order to make that measurement. Okay. However, there are a lot of capacitors that are at a higher value that you can test in circuit, albeit you need to know what you're looking at when it comes to your multimeter. Again, general rule of thumb, if I'm at like a hundred microfarad cap, Okay, and I'm reading around 150, 140, something like that. Generally speaking, I know if I was to pull that cap out, it's going to measure around 100 and be within 10% tolerance, okay, at, at a minimum. Uh, 470 microfarad caps. Generally speaking, again, if it's in circuit and I'm getting somewhere around like 550 to 600, it's probably going to be good. But if it's way less than 470 or say, I don't know, like 670 or 680, then I probably need to pull that component out and test it. And, and so those are just kind of things that you get over experience. And that's ultimately good for business, especially when you have your customer. 
because it affords you the ability to get through and test things, even in circuit, even if, you know, to make a good educated guess before you start wasting time from removing things out of circuit. Okay. Now, after capacitors, the next thing I'll check if I, and this is typically if the device will now power up and I'm still missing functionality is I'll start looking at uh, ICs and checking pins. Okay. Why? Well, because they're all going to have a VCC or a VDD and a ground, something along those lines. I can check the voltages there. Okay. If there is a signal or something, I can use my oscope to check that. So I'm looking for data and stuff. And if that data is missing, then I'm going to start going to transistors. Okay. Standard NPN, PMP switching type transistors or diodes and then resistors. Okay. And generally speaking, you don't have a whole lot of issues with, with resistors in, uh, you know, mid eighties and beyond electronics. I'm not saying you can't, but it's been at least my experience that you don't have those issues. And a lot of times transistors, yeah, they do fail, but, uh, I find them to be less common, uh, in mid eighties to, to onward devices. Most of the time it's capacitors. So that's just a general rule, rule I follow. So I want to show you something. Uh, now, I was able to replace all these capacitors minus this one because uh, I just don't have the, uh, I've got the capacitance rating, but not at 25 volts or higher. The uh, 2200 uh, microfarad capacitors I have, I've got one at 16 volts and one at 10. So I'm going to have to order this one this one, but I noticed an anomaly when I measured it in circuit, which was odd. And so I pulled it out and look, we're only getting 650 something nanofarad. So that's not even one microfarad. That is way off. The good news is, is because this is on the higher voltage side, then that kind of confirms why I believe we have issues with the low voltage. Okay. Although I thought it would strictly be on the low voltage side, uh, this is telling me that it was predominantly on the high volt, higher on a higher voltage side. So I don't even need to discuss the uh, tolerance for this guy because it's, it's just way off. Uh, so 470 microfarad capacitors, this one and this one, uh, in the power supply section. Okay, I replaced them. They're 16 volt rated caps. The upper limit to these is a uh, 564 if we're speaking in terms of 20%. So if I'm above that limit and on occasion edit, so this one is obviously above 564. Oh no, 565. Let's see if I can get a good reading on here. All right, 567. 568, slightly outside at 20%. Yeah, it's getting replaced. Okay. Or say it's right there at 20% at the upper end of that limit, or say if it was at the lower end of the limit. Yeah, you're going to get replaced. All right, here goes another 470, 16 volt cap. Yeah, 584, 570. Yeah, outside of that, that tolerance, outside of 20%. It's coming out. What's another one we can do? Uh, let's see. This one was 470 at 10 volt. I don't think this one was outside 20%, but I think I pulled it out of a, out of an area that I felt like I needed a little more accuracy with it, with whatever this was supporting. So, yeah. But, um, 490. So, you know, that's, that's within 10%, if I'm not mistaken, but you know, that's still slightly higher. Um, I went ahead and just changed it. All right. So this was a 220 microfarad cap. Which, by the way, if even with my capacitors that replace, uh, if they're not, you know, one or two microfarad above or below the, uh, the assigned value, I don't use them. Actually, the first capacitor I pulled out to replace this with was reading like 490 and uh, I didn't use it 
So I threw it away. Well, that's just me trying to think of the customer and longevity. All right, so this one's supposed to be 22 microfarad. And we are getting, excuse me, 220 microfarad. And we are getting 270. The upper limit for a 220 microfarad cap would be 264. So yeah, outside 20%, gonzo. Uh, let's see. This is a 4.7 microfarad cap. Okay, the, the upper limit on it should be 5.64. And this one was getting pretty close. So I just went ahead and pulled it out. 5.4, you know, or 200 nanofarad out. But uh, within 20%, but it was in the part of the circuit where I wanted it to be closer to like 10%. So I pulled it out. And then here goes a uh, 22 microfarad cap. And the lower limit on a 22 microfarad shouldn't be lower than 17.6 if we're talking about a 20% tolerance. And this is even significantly lower than that. So yeah, it was pulled out as well. So I'm going to uh, order up this one and then some replacement disc capacitors uh, that we have up here. I'm going to get them in and then I'm going to get reassembled and see if it powers up. All right, well, I've got those components replaced and I've got it plugged in and currently connected to my dim bulb tester. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and power it up and hopefully nothing goes bang and we'll see if it turns on. Moment of truth, give me a second. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Would you look at that? Oh, I can't believe that. I can't believe that whatsoever. Um, I, let, I, I don't know what to say. Uh, give me a minute. I think I, I'm going to get this button up and, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll test it out to see how it forms. Okay, so you're going to have to forgive me for a second because I had to turn uh, a couple of filters off on my mic. So this comes across really loud I do apologize um, but I was able to get it put back together actually let me move this antenna out of the way for a second that I made going to my sig gen a little simple loop antenna and I uh, I was able to actually find a couple screws to replace the missing ones from the back here out of my uh, little miscellaneous screws bin it was a uh, something like this now it wasn't coated black like like the one in the center, it's silver, but I mean, having a screw in there is better than nothing. A tad bit smaller. Oddly enough, I think I got this out of uh, an Xbox 360 or something way back in the day when I was repairing consoles way before YouTube. But uh, we can test this thing out. Let me uh, turn it on real quick. Huh. FM seems to be working. Our seat button works. You can just see a little bit of a learning curve. Trying to figure out, especially um, Johnny Gover. I mean, Kaylani Ricketts as well throws hard, has great. Yeah, movement. volume's working. You know, just seeing Elam adjust, and she's done such a great job. As the yeah, this the balance for our, our speaker seems to be working. From Don. Yeah, bass is definitely working. Let's see if we can do treble and get something else. Yeah, the bass button's working as well. Uh, turn the volume down for a second. I don't want any YouTube strikes, but. Uh, the sleep work, yeah, you can change your, your sleep time. Looks like increments of five. So that's good. Uh, let's see. Alarm one, you can set alarm one, you can set alarm two, that's good. Uh, somehow, I suppose you can also change the time. 
turn alarm one and two off. Yeah, I don't know how to set the time on this. I'll have to figure that out. But yeah, everything seems to be working. What about AM? And as typical, I'm going to be hard pressed to pick up AM inside my office with all these switch mode power supplies and stuff. But uh, it appears we have AM. I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll put this uh, little homemade uh, antenna over near the AM bar antenna that was up here in what, this corner or that corner. I don't, I, I don't remember. But uh, we can turn the SIGGEN on and uh, see if we can pick up AM. Let's see, what was that? 530 kilocycles? And let me turn it on. And we sure do. And we get a pretty strong signal at a low amplitude. Wonder when it cuts out. Yeah, you can tell it's starting to cut out. About right there. I, mean, I can still hear it barely, but, but just barely. Well, that's good. How selective is it? Let's, uh, let's go up, uh... uh looks like we change in a... Frequency selection of 10k hertz there, so that seems to be working pretty well. Let's try uh, 1610. Ooh, a lot more sensitive on the upper side of that scale. there's when I hear it cutting out so that's that's a pretty sensitive radio at least within my office with my SIGGEN and the and the source being as close as it is um, yeah still very selective I'll tell you what uh, I'm gonna get this thing cleaned up a bit and uh, get it over into my kitchen where I get better reception and we will close out this video and she actually uh, cleaned up pretty nicely, the plastics and everything on them. So I'm I'm pretty happy about that. Got got a nice little got kind of up there and shiny and yeah, she sounds pretty nice. Pretty decent bass. The country. Yeah, he was in a lot of trouble. He was probably going to be kicked out of the military. I, I think a lot of people were yeah, expecting that in and here. around him and his... Let's see what we get. Hospitals, I thank God for them, but still don't like them. And, uh, you know... And the nurse came in and said, what's the matter? You sick? And I said, no, I'm scared to death. And she I'm actually pretty surprised that then I with this radio. She came in and said, I mean, it, typically you get uh, you know, radios that work off of discrete circuits versus integrated circuits just tend to have better sensitivity, uh, better performance, but... I mean, I'm picking up pretty much everything I'm I'm used to picking up. Yeah, I'm very surprised by this radio. Actually, it's kind of uh, kind of sad in a bit that I gotta bill a customer and return it. I'm actually actually kind of liking this radio but uh anyways if you've enjoyed this video please uh please consider subscribing if you're new to this channel 
Uh, let me know how you enjoyed this video by giving it a thumbs up and commenting in the description. You know, all that kind of stuff. But uh, that's going to do it for this episode here on Having Fun Repairs. It's been uh, great working on this radio and I'm happy to get it, to have it repaired and get it returned to the customer. Anyways, take care and goodbye. Bar.